Okay, for the action-packed second half. So, uh, we talked a little about changing curtain wall panels to different type. Let me go ahead and, oh, talk about doors and another variation on curtain panels you need to know about. A very good question came up at the break that looked like this. Someone was asking about changing one of the panels on one of the uh, curtain walls to a different type and sort of couldn't do it. And let me tell you about what's going on. Okay. You might remember from the first half that we had a pattern-based curtain panel or curtain wall and we had another one that we sort of just completely customized. And when things are pattern-based, okay, they actually try to lock themselves in such a way that you don't accidentally change things that are being determined by the pattern. So let me see if I can find an example of that. For example, oh, this mullion right now, let's see if I can grab it. I might want to try and get rid of it. But notice as I select it, it's actually pinned right now. It's kind of half locked right now. And that's really just all about, okay, I'm going to let you change it, but I'm going to make you do something explicitly to authorize me to change it before I do that. Because in general, you told me this is a pattern-based thing. So if you have something like that, it's pinned. Notice it's grayed out over here. It's not going to let me change it. If you have something that's pinned like that, what you got to do is just unpin it. And you can either click on the pin or it's up here in the toolbar. We'll unpin up there. But if you click on that, okay, that opens it up. And when it's unpinned, then you could delete it, change its properties, whatever it is you want to do. So the specific example was, oh, someone had a panel. They wanted to go through and duplicate the panel. Is that one already pinned? That one looks like it's already unpinned. That's funny. It doesn't look like those are pinned. I'll stick with the mullions. If you get the pin, unpin, and now I can go through and change its properties. But watch out for that with pattern-based things. Okay, you might have to unpin things. Let us talk about the last variation on curtain panels I want you to sort of know about, and that's the issue of doors. Let's talk about that. Doors in curtain panels or curtain walls, yeah, you know, that ought to be not too bad a thing to do, but there's sort of a trick to it, and this is, again, one of those things that everyone gets in trouble the first time they try to do it. So I'm going to tell you, it's going to make perfect sense today, and three days from now when you're trying to do it, you're going to not remember this, but you'll remember there was something weird about it. Okay, and here's how it works. You want to put a door in this curtain panel. So you say, great, I'm going to go out and get the doors. So I'm going to go out to the architecture tab, grab the doors, see if I can find a nice door. I'm going to try and put it in there, and I get the, you know, cannot place here. Okay. You can't put a regular door into a curtain panel. It doesn't understand them that way. It's going to sound weird, but this is how curtain panels think about doors. Curtain panels are made of all these panels, some of which are fixed, some of which can be hinged and have some operation to it. So a door in a curtain panel is actually just a special type of panel, a hinge panel. Okay, so you can file that one away. It's going to come back like three days from now. You're going to remember this and want to do it. And here's how you got to do it. We're going to go through and choose a panel, and there's a couple things we have to do. Um, since it really is a panel, we have to actually make an opening, which is the size of the door we want to put in there. And then B, we have to choose the panel that's in there and change it from being a fixed piece of glass to something that's going to swing. Okay? So that's the general you know, rule we're going for right now. So let's go ahead and see if we can implement that. If I wanted to put a door in here that's maybe four feet wide by seven feet tall, something like that, here's what I got to do. I'm going to choose where I want that door to be. Maybe it'll be right in the middle here. Okay. And to put that four foot door, my seven foot tall door, I'm probably going to have to knock out that grid and knock out that one right there. I'm going to have to take out those two things. So here's what I do. I'll come on in. I'll grab that mullion. Let's see if I can grab that mullion. I might have to tab to get it. It's pinned right now. I'll unpin it and delete it. Okay, I'm also going to go through and grab that one right there. So I'm grabbing it. So far, so good. We're getting better. We still have three panels within that space, but we're going to go through and take out some grid lines that will unify it into more of a single panel. 
So what I got to do is this. I'll grab the panel or that grid line. And I have this choice of adding or removing segments. If I click on that segment now, it'll knock it out. Okay, similarly, I can choose that grid. I'm going to remove a segment and knock it out. So now I have something that's pretty close to what I need. Okay. Again, if I need to add a segment to it, no problem. If I want to put one and really make sure that it is exactly seven feet tall, I'll go to the gridding. I'll put something in here. I actually just want to put it across a single piece of the curtain wall. I don't want to put it across the entire curtain wall. But I'll add a line in here. Oops. And even in here, I could probably come up with some temporary dimensions. See if I can get that guy. You. Let me move this dimension on down. See if I can. It's only about five feet tall now. That's not very good. Actually, that's seven feet tall. This is kind of a small little uh, door here. Get rid of that one too. And take out that one more grid line. I'd forgotten how small my grid is. Okay. But your job, your essential job, that's not it, is I want to get you, Mr. Gridline. Mr. Gridline, I'm going to add or remove. Take you out. Okay. Your job is to first create a panel that has what you need, or the size you need. Okay. So far, so good? More or less. You're going to play with that and kind of get it right. So make the panel the size you want. Next thing you do is we want to change that panel to the new pivoting door panel type. And if I choose that panel, you will see, if I kind of hover over the edge and tab around a little bit, that I can choose the panel. I'll go looking at my panel types and I've got, I got glazed, I got solid, I got solid blue, I got everything but what I need. I don't have anything that looks like a door panel yet. So if I don't have a door panel type and I need a door panel type and someone told me there is a door panel type, you might need to go ahead and load one in from the library and pull it into your project. Okay, so here's what you do. We'll go ahead and say insert. We're going to load a family. You're going to go out there and find these panels and where they might be. It's interesting. You kind of want them to be under curtain wall panels because that's what I just told you they were. But the weird thing is they don't live there. They actually live under the doors instead which is entirely counterintuitive because I just told you it's not a door, but for some reason they put it in that folder. Okay, and you might want to move it around in your installation, but they live in the door folder even though they actually install as components. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I got some nice double glass door. I got some nice single glass door. I have a kind of double door storefront that has a little bit of uh, framing around it. So depending on whether I want to see some framing or not. I can actually grab all these. You can actually grab several pieces at a time and say open, bring them all in. Okay, they are now part of the system. So you say, great, I just downloaded that curtain panel door. I am ready to go. I'm going over to architecture. I'm going over to door and I'm going to find it. And you don't find it there because it's not a door. Okay, which again is part of the confusion. So it's not a door. It's a curtain panel. What do we have to do? We come on over and we see if we can get the panel. Pop. Okay. And then within that, now we actually have some different panel types. So we have the ever popular curtain wall single glass, which looks like this. Okay. Single door, four feet wide, or whatever it was, seven feet tall. Could be. A little bit heavy. You can sort of decide what you like. I have curtain wall double glass. Okay. Two two-foot door panels. Might be better. Kind of depends on what you want to do architecturally. Does it fit the doors to the panel? Yes. 
That's why you have to make the panel the right size before you change it out, because it'll make it whatever size. If this was you know, 20 feet tall by eight feet wide, it would give you a gigantic door. Okay, so it just really says whatever that panel is, swap it in with a hinging element that has a doorknob on it. If you prefer to put a little bit of glaze or uh, framing around that as opposed to being all glass, we have the curtain wall storefront, which sort of has a more conventional appearance to it. So it's really whatever your architectural need is. Okay, we can go ahead and customize these however we need. Okay, you can also really, you know, just to show you, I could make any panel a door. may not be a very sensible door. In fact, in that one, the door handles, the, the part's not well-defined, so the door handles are popping way up high. But uh, we can customize that as we need to. So that's what the curtain walls and doors. The important thing is just learn to think of them as a type of panel, and you'll be in good shape. Other types, you have solid panels, you have door panels, you have window panels that open up too, like uh, casement panels, awning panels, things like that. Okay, so that's pretty much for curtain walls and all that. What I'd love to do now is talk about floors and roofs, because that's where I think most of you are going to have the more interesting challenge in terms of getting the assignment done. Okay, so is that good? Okay, let's talk about floors and roofs. Four floors, and again, floors are the easy one. Let's go ahead and I'll, I'll put a floor in under here. So, got my nice little seven sided building over here. We're going to put a floor in there. Let's even here, I think I have this all set. I think they're all, are they reversed? I think they are reversed. I sort of noticed that as they went down. I'm gonna flip the walls. I think I do. I keep on trying to do it more than one at a time and then I right click, but it never seems to work. It's because I want that to, no, I guess it's weird in 3D it doesn't work. Okay, so, good question. Hover over it, tab to get them all. And then I can say, now see, it won't do if it's all. It's interesting. It's only, uh, we'll figure out what the rule is. Maybe it's uh, just individually select them. Is that it? It's the loop that throws it? Maybe that's it. So I can change walls orientation. Yep. Is it doing them all? Is it just doing the one? I think it's still just doing the one. I'd, yeah. In my mind, there's still a little bit of a bug in there. But we'll figure that out. Won't be the first time, won't be the last time. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna put a floor in this thing. So let's talk about floors. Floors, floors are a boundary thing. So we're gonna choose the floor tool under the architecture tab. You are going to choose a type of floor, whether it's a generic kind of concrete floor slab, I think is what you have in your project, or a wood frame floor, whatever it is. I'll choose a floor. I'll do the wood one for this one. We are having a couple different properties we can set. One is the notion of the offset of the floor. So let's talk about this. This is kind of an interesting one. How high should the floor be? In general, I like to put my floors right at the level. So I'll put my slab right at level one, because level one will really be defined as top of slab. Okay. So I'll tend to sort of basically put floors at that level. But if you want to, you can sort of raise or lower things a little bit, and that comes in useful sometimes. We'll show you that in just a second. But for right now, let's put one right in at the floor level, really at the bottom of the walls. And how that would look is, again, I can just sort of draw something. Okay. Or probably a way that I think is a little bit better is to go through and pick walls. And within the one I'm picking walls, I like to extend into the wall core. I'll show you what that does. So I'm coming up here to the wall. I've chosen that wall. And notice what it's done is if you look really close, you can see that it's placed that line, that suggested line, really right at the inside face of the studs. Okay. It's got a wall core, it's got the wrong face of the wall core, because they have an inside and an outside face. What I can do is choose that pink line, modify it, and flip it over. Let me take it out though and show you how we got started with all this, which is when you put that in, it's actually sensitive to where you click. If I'm clicking on the inside of the wall, it'll guess the inside face. If I click closer to the outside face, it'll put it on that side to start with. So if you want to place it carefully to get going, that'll save you a little bit of time. I can then go through and click the other walls. 
and grab them all. Okay, and that's enough to make that floor. Okay, question? Yeah. 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 Do you think we could go through and choose a chain of walls and kind of select them all at once? Since we like doing things as chain of walls. And let's give it a try and show you. We'll choose the wall tool. I'll hover over that wall. If I tab, I can actually get all the walls and get the whole chain at once. So real quick yeah, operation. Okay, this floor is gonna be at level one. As soon as I hit check mark, it'll finish it and the floor is there. Let's take a look at it. It's hanging out over here. Notice the floor is actually sticking down below the level of the walls right now. And that's actually okay. In most cases, we do have the floors stick on down. They're going to come on down and sit on top of the earth, really be that slab that's on grade. We'll often go through and do this little thing to the walls, though. So for people who know the construction detail, what we often do is the slab's kind of hanging out here. We put the wall on top, and the core of the wall does that. But what we often do is we do this little thing where we take the exterior finishes and we wrap them around. Okay? And the way the general rule works is we want to keep them, oh, let's say four inches above the earth because we don't want the earth and termites and water to get up into the wall. So what we can do is actually bring that wall down a little to do that, the exterior surface of it. How would you do that in terms of modeling if you want to? And again, you don't have to do this for the assignment, but if you want to sort of get it accurate in terms of how we typically do it in industry, we'll grab that wall, or all the walls if you want to, and what we do is we give them a little base offset. If I want it to be at six inches and I want it to drop down so it's four inches above, I might give it a base offset of two inches down. That way it'll just do that little wrap. So minus zero, two. Okay. And that'll just hug the surface down a little bit. It'll look right in section if you cut it now. So that's just a little nuance. You don't have to do that. But you know, it's, it's that little piece if you're thinking about how the walls and the floors all work together. So floors, the big thing is get a boundary. And if you can get a solid boundary going all the way around, you might have to do some trimming. If there's little gaps between the pink lines, you might have to kind of do a little cleaning up. But it's really, if you can get a solid boundary, it'll generate a floor. Now floors, let me tell you about two variations on floors that are useful to you. Okay, When we define floor boundaries, you have the choice, if you want to, of creating holes in there. And this works very much like the wall profile, in that anytime we draw a profile, if you have the outer ring, it'll go through and create positive. If you do an inner ring, it'll subtract things away. So how that works on floors is, let me grab this floor. I should warn you, floor is actually pretty hard to grab because there's almost always some other piece of geometry which is hanging over the edges. So it takes a little work. You might have to do a couple tabs to get your floor. But if I choose the floor and I edit the boundary, and again, I can do this in 3D or in uh, 2D. Okay. The pink boundary is reactivated. If I want to put a hole in that floor, I can do that by grabbing one of the tools and drawing another boundary. Okay. So that'll work. Like that won't work, okay? Or variations of uh, kind of cutting out what this will work. I can go through and pull down. Okay. Not gonna quite work yet because it's got that intersection right now. What I need to do is a little trimming to kind of really make that, fix up that outer loop. So I'll split it and do some trimming. Okay, so that'll make a notch. So why do we put holes in floors? Things like, oh, atriums, like the green atrium, the blue atrium, and Y2E2. Those are all big floor holes that are cut. Um, elevators, uh, stairways, all sorts of things like that. And we can cut holes individually, like uh, by trimming any individual floor like this. We're going to learn when we start doing multi-story buildings next week how to do something called a shaft, which is like an opening which cuts up like you know, a whole series of floors and cuts out everything in its way. But making floor openings. Works pretty good. This is kind of an interesting question. What's happening here is, if ever you have basically geometry which is intersecting with each other, and in this case, I actually do. 
because I told that wall to come on down and have a base offset of like two inches, there's actually a teeny tiny little overlap there between two different elements, the wall and the floor. So when it notices that, it'll ask you this question. It says, hey, your floor overlaps the walls. Do you want to join that geometry and cut out the intersection or just leave it as is? And you can leave it overlapping, but this is generally a pretty good thing to do because what that'll do is, as we think about the materials on the wall, as opposed to over counting for the part that really isn't there where it'll be cut out, it'll actually knock that out and give you a really clean intersection. So again, this will become more important when we start doing multi-story buildings, but the reason I'm getting it is because I have that little bit of an overlap right down in there. And if you do, kind of cut it out there. Let me kind of show you the difference. Well, let me just do it. The nice thing is if you draw a section through, see if I can make this work. And I turn up the resolution. You actually see it's doing a little better in terms of the studs sort of stopping up here, but the walls are just wrapping down a little bit further. Let me drop it down a little further even still so you can sort of see it even more. So that might be pretty similar to the way you'd actually have the real construction detail. Okay, so we go ahead and put floors in. That works pretty well. You often want to put more than a single floor because you might want to have a floor for the main part of your building. But often if you have a doorway, for example, I'll go through and put some nice door in here. Yeah, let's put a big door in there. When you go stepping out of that building and you're realizing that you're still a few inches off the ground, you might want to put a little pad, some sort of little uh, like entryway there. You know, it's for the egress to make sure that you aren't just sort of stepping down either too far or down onto uh, like the earth. So we always go ahead and put some sort of landing outside of doors. And in terms of putting that there, like this is a wooden floor there, this is right at level one. If I want to put a landing out there, I'll usually do something like this. I'll go through and make a second floor made of concrete and just put it out there like it's a pad and lower it a couple inches. So yeah. It could be concrete, right? No, it could be something else. It could be wood, but then we have to sort of make sure the wood is durable in terms of weatherproofing and making sure it's not going to rot. So that's the difference. If it's, if it's a wooden thing, it pro it'll probably ultimately land on some concrete, just to kind of from a weatherproofing thing. But to do the floor, just go ahead and choose it. We'll choose some other type. I'm just going to go for the uh, generic floor here. But I'm going to draw it. And the important part is this little height offset. What happens is when we go through and we do put some sort of little oh, landing, what we'll probably do is actually put the other floor down a few inches. So if this is like my little landing out here, it's often oh, down one or two inches because you don't want to be at exactly the same level. If water hit it, would roll back into the building. You usually step down an inch or more. Okay. And you can do a simple landing like this. If it was a big sort of system that had more height, you could actually put a stairway in there. But right now we're just going to do it as a landing. And I'll put that in here. I'll just draw. They're usually at least three feet as a minimum. And I'll finish that up. So now I actually have two different floors. So I got this whole thing going on here. I got that landing. Actually, it looks like I didn't offset it. We want to offset that down. We'll go ahead and put it in there. Let's say mine is zero foot two. Okay. Just drop it a little. <clears throat> so in general, if you keep your floors right at the floor level and you keep them your doors right at the floor level, don't give any sort of special sill height. What we often do is then lower things relative to the floor level. Okay. This building doesn't have any earth around it. That's why it's all kind of floating out in space. That's kind of the gist of floors. So let's, let's stop and talk about floors for a second, because floors, most people tend to get the hang of pretty quickly. As, as you're working with your own models, is the, the notion of floors pretty much making sense? Yeah. Okay. But the only time you get in trouble, it's that whole thing about you know, the core, not into the core. 
That can be a little bit confusing, but generally, if you get a good boundary line, you're in great shape. Okay, so let's switch the discussion and instead talk about roofs, because that's where this thing sort of starts getting a little wild and woolly. Okay, so let's talk about a roof, and oh, even for the roof, let me do this. I'm just gonna open up a new model, because those are sort of weird shapes that'll give us different variations you probably don't care about. Let me come back over here and I will do a simple little wall structure going up to level two. Okay, and maybe something like this. This is what an awful lot of houses in America look like at a high level. Okay, so that's level one. I'm going to put a roof on this. When I go through and put a roof, I'm going to draw a boundary, but I don't want to put the roof at level one. I actually want to put it at level two. I want it to be up, raised a little bit. What I can do is choose level two. Notice when I go to level two, the building's still there. It's kind of grayed out a little bit. It's out of range. It's sort of in the distance a little bit. We can still select it, but it's considered not on level two. It's on the level below. And we're going to start drawing a boundary by choosing the roof tool and saying roof by footprint. Roof by footprint is the, probably the easiest way to define roofs. There we just trace a boundary. And yeah, it'll go through and put a roof in coming up from all sides. So we can go through and use the drawing tools and just draw a boundary, draw a rectangle, whatever we want. Or what I like to do is actually choose the walls because again, that wall connection makes them linked. So if the walls move, the roof will move. I have this choice over here of extend into the core. Just so you know what that's all about. That is, we're gonna put a overhang on this roof. And the question is, as we measure the overhang, do you wanna measure from the face or do you wanna measure from the core? Just two different places, just two depends. Yeah. It actually is truer typically to measure from the core because the roof will typically be on before the face is there. So I usually turn that on and I'll put an overhang, oh, like two feet just to get ourselves started. Notice it says define slope, that checkbox is on. So as I go picking walls, each wall is going to be assumed to have a slope to it, or a roof surface is going to assume to have a slope that comes off that wall. So let's show you what that looks like. I'll choose some walls as I hover over. Looks like my overhang didn't stick, even though I didn't put it in. Let's come back again. Picking walls, extend into core, two feet, hover. It sort of suggests which side it's going to be on. Notice when it puts it there, it put a little like triangle there. That's indicating that's going to have a slope coming up. Similarly, slope here, slope here. I'm just going to grab them all. For you people who like to chain and grab them all, that'll work. So I'm just going to get a real quick roof all the way around the whole thing. That will do it. This is going to create a roof that slopes up from all sides. Okay, which is probably not what I want, but it's a good starting point. Let me say select it or finish it. Take a look at it. So this is what's called a hip roof. Okay, very common in prairie construction. Oh, a lot of like ranch houses across the US have this. I can lower the slope. That's a little bit steep, so I'm gonna lower it to like five, 12. In terms of what that designation means, it's as we measure this roof, it's this notion here. For every 12 inches of run, how much rise is there? So it's just another way, if you don't want to talk about it in terms of degrees, it's just a way of sort of specifying that. So I got this roof and it's looking pretty good. Now, if this isn't the shape of the roof that you have in mind, and chances are it isn't, you might want to do all sorts of things. We might want to have something called a little more of a gable roof, or for example, on this end of the house, as opposed to having it slope up, we might want it to come straight up and have a gable end wall there. And here's how you would do that. If I choose the roof, and again, I can edit it in 3D or in 2D, you'll see that each of the different little segments has that slope on it. And if you want any segment not to slope, all you have to do is choose that segment and then just turn off the slope. And then I'll finish. So again, okay, what I'll do is I'll choose the roof and I'll edit the footprint. So when we have roofs selected, you get the modifier roofs and you can edit the footprint. And then I can choose the roof segment and it's right here. We can turn off that defined slope. 
Actually, it's over here in the properties palette too, if you prefer it over there. So when we say, okay, I get something that looks like this. And I think, okay, that's, that's not too bad. I can get the hang of this, where it's going to slope, when it's not going to slope. You might be looking at it and saying, okay, that's pretty good, but I, I seem to have these, these holes in the walls that might be giving me some troubles because, you know, birds are flying in. That's probably not very safe. And you could say, oh, it's going to be a lot of work because I have to go back and fix my wall. And you told me about that edit wall profile. I bet I have to get in there and start adjusting the top to get it to follow the wall. Okay. And you could go ahead and do it that way, but this is such a common situation, they actually put in a really good shortcut for doing what we need to do here. Where what we can do is whenever we have a wall, and in theory we want it to go up and attach to a roof, okay, you can choose the wall, and instead of editing its profile, we can say attach the top. And then just choose the roof and get it to pop on up. Same thing here, choose it, attach, now the cool thing about attaching the roof is this. If you actually choose the roof and you give it a different slope, okay, the attachment stays. Okay, so great. Hey, if anything happens to the roof, that, ha that works nicely. Similarly, if I choose that wall and in that wall, as opposed to just being this big old solid wall, I go through and change a piece of that wall to be some big old curtain wall. Okay, you'll be smart about this thing too. Okay, so walls and attaching walls to roofs, hugely kind of powerful in terms of doing that. So you're gonna start doing a lot of attaching things like that and really ultimately make your life much easier. Through that. Now, yes? Can you Oh, sure. All right. What we would do with that, let's kind of show you another variation because it's a really good one, is if, for example, you really want most of the walls, you really only want it to slope up either flat or you want it to slope up in a single direction. I think it's probably what you're thinking about. Let me uh, turn that off. Oops, you. Turn you off. And turn you off, too. Okay. So what I've done is I've just redefined this in such a way that there's really only one sloping surface. Okay. If I do this, it'll give me a roof that looks like that. Okay. Um, again, a little tall. If I go ahead and lower that to more like 3 and 12 or 4 and 12, this probably looks a lot closer to what you have in mind. Okay. And then what I would do is take this and I'd attach them. The roof. So a lot of you'll have buildings that look like this. This is what I call a shed roof. So what's a shed roof? A shed roof is really just a roof where it only slopes off of a single side. Okay, or it can be completely flat if you wanted to just by taking all the slope out. So there's variations on that. You can come up with butterfly roofs where they come up from two sides. If you want to do a butterfly roof, it's actually easier to do two different roofs. One that goes this way and one that goes that way. So don't be afraid to kind of put multiple roofs in if you need to, to go through and kind of get the geometry you want. But before we leave, and I have to leave in just a few minutes here, is let's go ahead and show you one other one. There's an example that's out there in coursework, which may help you, of a very common condition that a lot of people try to work with. And it looks something like this. Okay, where this is what I call a clear story roof, where we have a roof sloping up from the left, we have a roof that's higher sloping up from the right, and we actually have a little wall in between where we put some windows in there. So if you want to do something like that in your building, please go ahead and download the file. Take a look at how we constructed it, because it's really fairly straightforward. Let me just kind of give you the high level. This is one roof. It's coming up from the left side. It just has a slope at the outside moving up. Okay, notice it doesn't have any base offset. The base offset's just at zero. Okay, so it's at level two coming up that way. This one over here, oops, not editing type, edit footprint. Okay, it's got a slope on the opposite side, but it also has this little bit of a base offset. That's how I get it to pop up and be ultimately not evenly in the center, but get it to shift in the two different directions. Yes? Should I put a wall? Yeah. 
That's the final thing in terms of doing this is after you get the two roofs, you'll end up with this funny little gap in the middle. So what you end up doing is in the roof level, putting a little wall across that you can then put the windows in. So that's how you do the middle. Ask your question again, because I'm not sure I got it. So did you mean to draw a whole wall in the middle of the three Oh, that's an easy way to do it. Yeah, because I could have done this. Good question. Yeah, I have this going from level two. You might have had that just going from level one, zero. Yeah, and then just adjusted the height. Yeah, that's another way to do it, but it's, you know, if you, draw it in the, if you draw it in the ceiling plan or the roof plan view, you can probably start at level two, then kind of adjust the height to kind of get it to be what you want it to be. And then even for this, if you really want to get good about it, and you don't need to do it for this assignment, but where this is ultimately constructed is because that wall is in there, there's actually a little beam element that you want to put under that wall to support it, where this roof bears on that beam, this beam supports this wall or the windows, and that roof comes the other way. So, yeah, if you want to do some sort of clear story roof, go ahead, it's on coursework. Just download this, take a look at it, see what's going on there, and we'll try to answer questions around that in office hours and lab hours. Okay, so let's go ahead and break for today so uh, we can clear out the room for the next folks who need to come in. Tonight, office hours are at what time, Lenny? Great, so 7.30 to 10.30, come on by room 184. Camp yourself out there, bring your models, and... We can help you sort of sort through all the little uh, questions you're having on your own. Because it all, it all sort of makes more sense when you try to apply it to your own design. So good luck and we'll see you later.